anyway, thank you, B, for allowing us to have this discussion. It kind of grew out of some different things that, that happened over the past couple of months. Um, but I really just want this to be a chance for us to kind of dialogue for you guys to listen. And I encourage you all to deeply listen um, throughout this. Again, as B said, that's why we chose to make this a webinar uh, rather than uh, a regular Zoom call. So what do we mean by how to be an ally to indigenous people? Um, it's an important topic. And I think um, particularly um, for all of us, it's not just about being an ally to indigenous people. That's what we're talking about today. But being an ally in general is an important thing. We know as disabled people, we need allies. Um, as um, people of color, we need allies. There's, you know, all sorts of it. So um, some basics to start. Um, and this is just simple, good common sense. Um, some good manners, really. Um, just some basics of being humble, listening more, talking less, being patient, not interrupting, all of those kinds of things. So um, again, that's why we're doing this as a, as a webinar. I encourage you all to really, really focus in and listen. Um, one of the things when I first came to work with Alinker and with B that I did was some uh, Instagram lives. And uh, uh, one of the first ones I did was on the importance of deep listening and the importance of silence. And I talked about listening to everything around you, listening to the wind, listening to um, the birds, the animals, uh, listening to your heart, listening to all of that. So I encourage you all to do that today. Um, the other thing that's basic when talking about allyship is if we're talking about indigenous allyship, indigenous persons lead the way, um, which means uh, let them take the lead, let them tell you what they want, what they need, all of that. So that's what I'm trying to do today. Um, mm. and, and deep listening is, it sounds so easy just to listen, but we're so used to living in a reactive world and only asserting what we think and it's us and them and all those things. So deep listening is really a practice of being present, and really listening without the chatter in your own head, trying to come up with an answer or with a question or with a response. Deep listening, just breathe. Yes. Yes. Be present and just listen. Deep breaths, deep listening. Um, yeah, we're always kind of formulating what our response is going to be um, rather than actually listening. So what does it mean to be a genuine ally? Um, I put this slide up here um, to kind of remind people of where we are as indigenous people. We, and it reads, if you can't see it, we as people didn't wake up one day with a good dose of trauma and grief and loss and drug and alcohol, family violence, child protection issues. It just, it didn't just happen. There was a journey from invasion and colonization. We got to where we're at. And what I mean by that is our traumas are the result of a system that was built to deny and destroy us. And so we need allies because we need people who can help us with dismantling that system and help us with working within that system. So um, that, that's my definition of, of being a good ally and what it means to be a genuine ally. Can you say a little bit more about um, acknowledging history and how it triggers you when people say, leave the history in your past because that happens a lot. Absolutely, yeah, it's, um, and we'll get into that in some further slides as well, but um, definitely because it is all recent history. Um, residential schools, the last one closed within the past 25 years. That's within my lifetime, well within my lifetime. Um, it's not distant history. Um, it does still affect us all, all day, every day. Um, it's a generational trauma that passes from generation to generation. It's um, caused a fracture of families and uh, 
all sorts of things that uh, we're all trying to deal with and we're trying to learn how to cope with and we're trying to reclaim our heritage that was taken away from most of us. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not way back when in history. It's definitely right now. It's not just a black chapter in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, why is it important to be a genuine ally? I love this quote. This is from a dear friend of mine, Echo Alec, um, who uh, is, um, actually, I'm not positive what nation she is from. I don't know. Um, but she's up there in Canada. She is, um, this is something that she posted a while back and it reads, no measurement of apologies can take genocide from the DNA. And again, that's what we were just talking about. This trauma is in our DNA. It's been passed down through generations. Uh, and that's not just something I'm making up and I'm saying that's literally been studied, um, how trauma can be passed down within DNA. Um, so we need your help, um, all of you out there. We need the assistance of people who are within the power structure um, because your privilege can give us opportunities or access to power that we otherwise normally wouldn't have. Um, so that's why it's important to be a genuine ally. Can you say something about when people say like, but we're all traumatized? Because that is one thing that I hear often, like, yeah, but you know, like that's not just indigenous people, everybody is traumatized. Like, yes, um, we're all traumatized and we all need allies. <laughs> we all need allies. Indigenous people need allies. The disabled community needs allies. Um, the black and, and persons of color, um, LGBTQ, um, all of those communities, we all need allies because we all are traumatized. And it's important to have that support from other groups and other people. Um, so it's not a contest. <laughs> it's not a contest of I'm more traumatized than you. We're all traumatized. Um, there is a difference though, that we're on the land of indigenous people. We're not on the land of disabled people. True. For example. Yes. So yes, allyship to everybody who looks and moves different than us, but the particular, I, I think the important, for me, the importance of being an ally to indigenous people is because I live on this land. Yes. And yes. this land was stewarded in, in good ways uh, for thousands of years. And since colonialists went over the world, um, the land is not stewarded in good ways anymore, but is measured in money. And a tree that is cut down is worth more than when it's standing in the Western system. And that's yes. just not a way that leads to a sustainable future. So it's not just being good allies for indigenous people for the sake of indigenous people. It's also for our own survival, I believe. Absolutely, so, yes. Um, indigenous values are something that um, have helped us steward this land for centuries. Um, and when you hear land back, a lot of people get threatened by that. Um, uh, that phrase of land back because they think we're just all going to come and, and steal the land back and nobody will have homes anymore and things like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about returning the stewardship of the land to indigenous people in indigenous ways. Um, that's very, very important. Um, but every community and individual is different. And I want to state that right now that um, there is no pan-Indigenous. Uh, I don't speak for all Indigenous people. Uh, I, uh, there are over 500 nations here in the US of Indigenous people, and I have no idea how many in Canada. I apologize for my ignorance, but um, uh, probably an equal amount in Canada, uh, if not more. And um, we all approach things a little bit differently. So there is no pan-Indigenous. Um, but there are some general things and um, and I can only speak to you from my heart and from my experience. So that's what I'm trying to do today. But so here's some suggestions to help you get started. <sighs> Number one is to listen and 
follow the community. Um, and by that, um, first of all, just as the slide says, learn and acknowledge whose land you're on. And it does my heart good to see so many of you putting it in the chat of whose land you're on that you've done that research. Um, but now that you've done that, I'm asking you to take a step further and go beyond that and start becoming aware of indigenous issues on the land that you're on. What's happening with indigenous people in your communities? Um, what's going on out there? Um, so um, build some relationships. Um, a lot of people will say, I don't know any indigenous people. Yes, you do. You just don't know you do. <laughs> so, um, you know, and if you want to meet indigenous people, seek, seek them out. Um, we're pretty friendly for the most part. Um, <laughs> um, and it's also uh, about um, representation. Um, being aware of when you're at events and meetings or in your workplace, um, knowing, um, uh, looking around and saying, hey, is there any indigenous representation here? Um, and if not, why not? Because maybe we need to hear those voices because we're on their land and they should have a say in what's going on right now. Um, so listen to and follow the community and center the stories around the community. And this is um, a big thorn <laughs> because what I mean by this is it's not about you. Um, <laughs> again, because we tend to be reactive um, to things, we tend to react to how how does this affect me? How do I feel about this? And, um, you know, it's a lot of, um, oh, that's horrible. That's awful. I'm enraged. I'm outraged on, for you and, and all of those kinds of things. And I, as an indigenous person, appreciate that. But at the same time, it's centering it on how it's, how it's affecting you. It's making you feel bad. It's making you feel outraged. And that shouldn't be where the focus is. The focus should be, wow, that must be horrible for indigenous people. Um, I need to know more about this history or I need to understand this better or I need to start sharing this with other people so that they understand um, this history and all of these things that have happened. Um, it was very apparent when the first 215 unmarked graves were found in uh, in Kamloops. Um, like this is known by indigenous people and people that have shown interest <laughs> in, in what happened in Canadian or US history um, with the residential schools, but people were outraged and they were like, oh my God, this is horrible. I didn't know this. And it was actually adding to the trauma of indigenous people because they have said this for years. They have tried to get a voice. There were, um, the Truth and Reconciliation um, Committee was going through in Canada years, a few years ago, and they came with um, 93 or something recommendations. And indigenous people have shared their stories and it was never listened to. And it was Absolutely. never acknowledged. So the truth on what actually happened wasn't there. So when people then, when the first 215 unmarked graves were found were completely outraged it was just adding to like see nobody listens to us and it was adding to the trauma and it's really important i think to be aware if you want to be an ally of who you are how you show up and what your the things that you say or that you add to them to the mix how they're being perceived specifically by indigenous people and if there's stuff that i need to learn i just need to google it and learn it before I'm asking Stephanie, like, oh my God, did you know that? Or, you know, how horrible that this happened. It doesn't help. So being aware what you say, how that is being received by indigenous people is, is very important in those instances or Absolutely. all the time, actually. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And I'll get into that more a little bit later too. And it's, but it's, it's, it's very true. And I would encourage all of you out there, if you have not 
actually gone and read the Reconciliation Act. Um, Molly, I didn't think to pull that link, but if, if you happen to be able to find it and can post it in there, it would be wonderful because um, it's filled with interviews of residential school survivors and um, their stories are um, gut-wrenching to say the least. And if you haven't read it, it's something that you need to be aware of and you need to know is part of, part of our history. And you say something that reminds me, Stephanie, when um, I hear often that people say like, oh, that's too hard for me to, to read. I, I don't want to look at that when there's interviews and, and stuff, mm -hmm. but I think it is essential that we non-Indigenous people listen to those stories so we can be part of the heart wrench and, and, and feel a little bit, feel into what, what it is for Indigenous people. Indigenous people cannot erase that from their minds. We yeah. cannot say like, oh, we don't want to look at that. That's the essence of showing up, that we do know what happened there, that we do listen, even though it's heart wrenching. Yes, it is heart wrenching, but we do need to look and watch and understand what the deep trauma is that it caused. Without yeah. truth, there is no reconciliation. We Absolutely. need truth and we need to feel the truth. Yes. And, and the truth is there, whether you acknowledge it or not. The truth exists on its own. It, it's not um, dependent upon whether you acknowledge it. Um, and it is, again, as I said, a part of our DNA. Um, and that gets into this slide, know the historical and cultural context. Um, I put up here just one of many different um, things in history that have been traumatizing for Native people. This is Remember the 38, which is the Dakota 38 in um, the Dakotas in 1862. It was the largest mass hanging in history. Um, and it was uh, perpetrated by Abraham Lincoln. And uh, it uh, was in response to a cow being stolen by a group of Native people who were starving. Um, so these are the kinds of things that, that are out there all the time. And, and that you will see native people sharing and talking about. And it's important that you um, know that these things are out there and that these things have happened. Um, but it's also important that, as I just said, you go out and Google it, um, go out and learn it um, because when we're sharing this with you, we're sharing it because we're working on dealing with it. And um, so we don't want to have to explain everything all the time. And um, the information is out there, it's easy to find. So if you see something like this, instead of you know saying, oh, oh, I need to find an indigenous person and ask them about this, just say, hey, I need to Google, what's the Dakota 38? Um, it's, it's out there's there. Also, there's also a lot of links on the Essence page on the Alinker. Um, Molly, maybe you can add that link too. We have an Essence page um, with uh, a lot of links to hist historic events that are crucial to know about. Yeah. Um, and also indigenous owned um, uh, ventures that we're supporting. So you can, you can go to, and you'll see Stephanie there too, because Stephanie is a beat worker, but there are all sorts of links to, uh, to ventures um, that you can support by buying their products, um, so. Yeah, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely do your own research. Um, don't always ask indigenous people to explain these things to you because usually when we're sharing these, again, it's because we're in the process of dealing with them. We're in the process of mourning. We're in the process of being angry. We're in the process of whatever. And to have to stop that process to explain to someone why we're going through this, um, as B said, just kind of adds to the trauma sometimes. So, um, so Google is your friend. <laughs> Another part of good allyship is never show up empty handed. And um, I, I uh, put this slide on here and we'll, Wawakia is a word that we have that means to help somebody in need and not ask for anything in return. And it's a hard thing to do, um, but it's important. 
and um, it's a definite part of our culture. Um, when I was introducing myself and I was talking about the, the 12 virtues, um, one of those virtues is generosity. And that's a very big one for most uh, indigenous people is a spirit of generosity and a spirit of sharing. Um, and we tend to be leery of people who don't exhibit that or who don't seem to understand that. So when you are coming to an elder, um, say you're coming to an elder to ask a question um, because you haven't been able to research it on your own um, and you're coming to find something out, it's important to come um, with a gift. Um, something, the traditional gifts are things like tobacco, cedar, sage, um, anything like that. Um, but in this day and age, a welcome gift can also be a bag of groceries, um, things that are needed. Um, so just, um, just know not to ever show up empty handed, um, because, uh, that's something that we, we look at, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And on the, um, on the generosity, it's like, um, Western culture is so used to being transactional. I give you something, I get something back. I give you something and right. I get a service and response or something. The, the difference between Western culture and indigenous culture is that it's not linear, transactional, it's relational. Yeah. So it's always for the good of the community, how you part of, um, of, of, of making the community better. And giving is just sharing. Giving is healing, <laughs> but we, if you go, go ahead, ahead. <laughs> well, we have a word in 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 my language called otuha, which means a giveaway, um, and that's just a practice. It's something that we practice on a daily basis, um, always. Um, and um, most Western culture doesn't understand that concept of just giving for the sake of giving. Um, I remember years ago, um, I just started working at a new job and I told everyone for my birthday, I was going to practice Otuha. And so I was going to bring food and a feast for everyone else for my birthday. And they all looked at me like I had two heads. They were like, why would you do that? You, you know, we should be doing that for you to celebrate your birthday. I said, no, you know, this is, I, I want to give um, in honor of this day. Um, um, but it was very hard for them to understand. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the Otuha practice, <laughs> um, and it's hard, it's hard, um, sometimes to give without expecting anything in return. Um, but it's very important and it is a, a very important practice for us. Um, and it's also the important. Otuha, the, people um in the northern territories have potlatch it's the same kind of um thing i'm sorry B, go ahead no 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 it's fine um the when you travel as a white person to indigenous lands wherever in the world i've traveled a lot to indigenous lands all over the world giving is something they always do you're always being gifted presence and it's important to show up with something that you're not just taking from the community that you're visiting but also just bring something because you know that, <laughs> um, yeah anyway and so, it's also important to never refuse a gift if an indigenous sure. person is gifting you um yeah. you know our western culture tells us we should go oh no 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 that's too much no don't i don't please don't mm -hmm. that's an insult mm -hmm. um that's an insult because you're refusing our gift. So, so just accept it graciously. Uh, another uh, thing I'd like to talk about is always seeking consent and permission. And um, this is another big, big thorn um, for, for me at least um, on a lot of things. It, because I see it happen so often that people don't ask consent or permission um, for everything from 
Like if I, I, I cannot tell you the countless number of times I've said, I'm going, you know, I've been in a group of people and said, well, I'll be in ceremony this weekend. And inevitably somebody says, oh, can I come? Um, if it was open to people, I would invite people. Um, you don't just invite yourself. Um, on a more general scale, I see it all the time in um, cultural appropriation by um, businesses, uh, especially businesses who take and use indigenous patterns, indigenous styles, um, all these kinds of things. And um, will often say if they're challenged on that, oh, but I'm doing this to honor native people or, oh, but um, I'm doing this to help um, maintain the culture. Um, no, we didn't ask you to do that. And you didn't seek permission to do that. Um, these are our um, crafts. These are our ways of doing things. Um, and we are a very generous and sharing people, but we don't react well when, when things are taken. Um, so um, you need to ask consent. And that goes to events and things as well. If there are indigenous events going on, um, we'll usually say if it's open to the public, if um, we want allies there. Um, so always make sure of that before you try to go and attend an event. Um, it also pertains to look, don't touch. Um, I cannot tell you how many times people have just taken it upon themselves to touch myself, my person, my things, um, because they're interested. And um, so I, I can tell you, like, I remember one time going to a powwow and I was wearing a medicine bag and um, it was a very nice medicine bag that I had made um, myself. And so it was very unique and different from anything that was being offered at the powwow. And I was just walking around the powwow. And if you don't know, medicine bags are very sacred to indigenous people. It's very private. You put uh, your own medicines, your own things in your medicine bag. You don't share that with other people, what you put in there. Um, but I was just walking around the, the powwow grounds and some lady came running up to me and literally grabbed it around my neck and pulled me towards her with medicine bag and she's like, oh my God, I love your medicine bag. Where did you get it? And I was just so <laughs> shocked and appalled. Um, but people, people feel like they have the right to do that. I've had people come up and grab my earrings and, and say, uh, oh, let me see your earrings. Um, you know, none of us really likes to be touched without someone's consent. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know what it is about indigenous people that <laughs> it really seems like there's a lot of that. I've had people come up and touch my hair. I've had, um, and even things, my house is full of beautiful native artwork, but it's also full of a lot of sacred things. Like I have my eagle feather on the wall. I have my pipe on the wall. All these things are sacred. They have a place on the wall because that's a place of honor for them in my house. But I've had people walk into my house and say, oh, wow, is that an Eagle fan? And they take it off the, the wall. It's not, it's not yours to touch. I didn't give you permission to touch that. Um, so just be aware of those things. Um, it's, uh, it's very intrusive. And again, that goes back to you know the very first slide of it's just common sense and good manners um, <laughs> to be a good ally. Um, and this is another one that uh, I think is also very important. Be responsible for yourself. Um, a prime example of this that I can give you is um, uh, many of you know about Standing Rock and the camp that was there as we were working as water protectors to protect the, the river there from the pipeline. and. Um, what happened was uh, we put a call out to allies to come, but so many people showed up without any means of supporting themselves. Uh, they showed up 
bringing no food, no shelter, nothing, and just expecting everyone at the camp to take care of them. And um, it became a burden rather than a help. So um, just um, I always remember that, that um, if you're showing up to help at an event, um, if you're showing up to help at a rally, if you're showing up to help with anything, make sure that you are responsible for yourself and you're not putting additional burden on the people who are there. Um, and again, it's just good common sense. I mean, it's, it's not just, just common sense. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it, it was amazing. We, we actually had to tell people to stop coming. Um, Somehow Thanksgiving comes to mind. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> there was a bit of a precedent set when uh, indigenous people <laughs> fed the colonial, the, the, the settlers <laughs> to keep them from starving. But that's not <laughs> what it's supposed to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we had to close though Chetty Sakons because it that we just had to tell people nobody else come because we can't deal with with you. We can't we can't feed you unless you can come and bring all of your own food, bring all of your own shelter, all of that. Um, it's it's more harmful than helpful. So just be mindful of that. Um, know when to step back. And by this, I mean, um, some things are sacred and private and not to be shared outside of our community. Um, so just know that when we say, I'm sorry, this is closed, or I'm sorry, I can't share that information with you, um, that it's, it's not an insult to you. Um, it's just that, um, your need to help doesn't override my right to protect my traditions and my privacy. Um, so just know that that's going to happen sometimes. Um, By the way, the woman in the front has one of those cooking scarves. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just you were talking about that and I see it. Good now. eye. <laughs> <laughs> This is a biggie. Saviors are not needed, solidarity is. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> I, I need someone to stand by my side. Um, I don't need someone to go in front of me and pave the way. Um, I want someone to be there with me, to link arms with me, to walk with me. Um, to push forward with me. I don't need someone to save the day by going ahead of me. Um, this is again a reflection on what our Western system has conditioned us to do. Identify everything as a problem and then go after it to fix it. But the essence is not in what you do. It's who you are and how you show up. Exactly. And again, it's not about me that I feel good because I fixed something, right? Right. But it's showing up for Stephanie and, in this case. And you have to remember that your way of fixing something may not be the way that we want to fix it. So again, it goes back to that very first slide, indigenous people lead the way. Um, so yeah, no, no saviors. <laughs> uh, be mindful of others' time and energy. We kind of touched on this earlier. Um, I put this slide up here. It's okay if you're indigenous and you don't have the energy to talk or think about residential schools right now, because this was a prime example when all of that was happening. Um, like we talked about, um, I cannot tell you the number of messages, private messages I got from people. I'm so outraged, this is horrible. What can I do? Tell me what to do. How can I support you? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. When I was well, going through push. that, yeah, I, I, I was so mentally and emotionally uh, exhausted by all of that. I didn't have the energy to be able to tell you what to do. So the messages that really touched me were the ones that just said, hey, I'm here for you if you need me. Hey, I'm thinking about you. 
um, hey, I love you, you know, things like that, um, because they didn't require me to do anything. They just fed me at that moment. Um, and it was also a time where, where you can understand that all indigenous people were deeply in mourning. And what you do when people are in mourning is like, I see you and I give space. I'm not adding burden to, um, to the people that are in mourning. I give space so that the mourning can happening. Absolutely, happen. yeah. And that's so important, it's so important. And I will give you, uh, and I've said this before to other people, and I, I give kudos to B for always being such an incredible ally. Um, we were in, in a meeting where some things were being said that were being very upsetting to me. And she could see the tears starting to form and come down my cheeks as I sat there and I was biting my tongue because it wasn't the time or place for me to speak up. Um, and all she did was private message me and said, I see you. And that was all I needed. That was all I needed in that moment. It's, all, it, it's also just anchoring to what you want other people to do at that moment. Like, like what would I want if I'm going through deep grief? I don't want people to try and fix it. Like it's, it's, it's easy. It's not just like, oh, how do we show up for indigenous people? It's also just common sense and, and recognizing in yourself, like how do you want people to show up for you if you're going through grief, through trauma too? And then it becomes so much easier, <laughs> so much yeah. more accessible. It's like, I see you because that's what I would want somebody to say at that moment. It's like, I see you. Just acknowledging of each other. Right? Yep without Absolutely. fixing anything because there's no problems to fix we can't fix all this stuff all we can do is show up for each other and and together um, feed a community that is healthier than the extraction that we see outside uh, oof. yeah <laughs> yeah um and again i mean this whole presentation and all it boils down to is just common sense and common courtesy and being kind and being mindful. Um, <sighs> lastly, do no harm to the community. And I love this slide, I love this phrase. It means our mouth is sacred. And we say it's sacred because it has the ability to make someone laugh or cry um, or to cause harm. And so we need to be careful. Um, we need to be mindful of our words. Um, our mouth is sacred. Um, That's beautiful. So, so um, if in doubt, don't. Um, if you don't know, if you're not sure if something is offensive, um, if you don't know what to expect at an event, any of those kinds of things, do your own research first. Uh, again, don't you know, immediately go to other indigenous people to ask them to explain, do your own research. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna be able to find the information you need. If you can't, then go respectfully to an indigenous person and ask them in a good, kind way. Um, I understand you may not have the energy to explain this to me right now. And if you don't, that's okay, tell me. Um, but I've tried and I can't find this information. Can you tell me about this? Um, your mouth is sacred. Just use it wisely. That's beautiful. And I just wanted to give credit where credit is due. Um, some of these uh, things were pulled from a similar resource that was done by Amnesty International. So. Wonderful. Are there any questions? Because um, this is the time to ask a question or to add something. Um, put it in the chat, and we'll um, we'll pick that up. And thank you, Stephanie, for hosting mm -hmm. this meeting and um, taking us through all the important parts of what a true ally. 
um, is and what true allyship to indigenous people is. Thank you uh, to have this opportunity um, mm -hmm. means a lot and I appreciate it. Um, I do see somebody asked in the chat about Pendleton blankets, whether they were appropriated. Um, they are, they are not indigenous owned. Um, they became very popular amongst indigenous people because they were very um, quality blankets that were given to them. Um, uh, but um, there are so many more now indigenous blanket designers out there. Uh, eighth generation is one that I can tell you right off the top of my head who makes incredibly beautiful blankets and they're all indigenous owned. So I encourage you if uh, Pendleton blankets and Pendleton style things are something that you like, uh, take a look at eighth generation. Mm -hmm. And something to come back to on the amount of nations in Canada. I don't know the total amount of nations, but there's three different groups, three um, major groups of indigenous people in Canada, which is the First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit people. And um, in those three groups, there's many nations. Uh, and um, yeah, but it's the, 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 the three majority groups that are always acknowledged. And Tina says, can I apply these concepts to the people I work with as well? Absolutely. I think you can apply those concepts to anywhere where you want to be an ally to people and where you, like what Stephanie said, <laughs> these are common sense things in how we want to be together. It's not, I mean, we made it today about indigenous people. Um, and the importance of that because we live on this land. But I think being an ally and um, seeing who you can be for the benefit of others and for the benefit of um, the larger community that we live in is essential. So yes, they apply to anywhere. And all of this kind of grew out of going back to the very beginning of this, when uh, we introduced the shirt, some people questioning why we were doing this shirt and why we were donating this money to this cause. And I said to B, maybe we need to do a Zoom call to explain this and help people understand why this is important. Um, so. Um, we had a comment of somebody about this shirt um, because all the proceeds beyond um, the cost of the shirt itself, purely manufacturing costs, handmade in Canada. Um, are going to the um, downtown east side Vancouver um, Women's Center. And somebody said like, well, you know, it's so expensive and why do I have to pay? It's like, well, <laughs> the thing is like you, you the t-shirt literally has every child matters on the back. And that means something if you walk around with that. Um, it is, and if you don't want to walk around with that or don't want to have the awareness around that, then don't wear the jersey. Um, so yeah, the proceeds are going to the downtown Eastside Women's Center. Um, women that have all been affected and traumatized by the uh, residential school system and other issues like homelessness and drugs. And it is a beautiful Jersey and um, it is a, a wonderful cause. So um, yeah. I encourage you all if you've been thinking about it. Yes, I uh, I wear it often. I've seen a few people also wear it. I know Laura has one and Melina has one. And I don't know. I forgot. I don't have all the names <laughs> uh, ready for everybody who's got one, but um, I've seen them around. They're just gorgeous. And they're super comfortable when you wear them when you go on your linker. They cool you right down when you're hot. So for people that have hot issues, MS, for example, um, cooling down is a is an important thing. This jersey is amazing for that. Are there any more questions? And I'm sorry that Shara could not um, join us, but Shara's husband has medical issues that she needed to tend to, and she excused herself. But we can all support Shara by um, um, by buying the Alinker jersey. 
and getting as much as much possible money to the downtown east side women's center um, oh that's an yes. interesting one how or should we acknowledge our feelings of guilt for a white privilege can i say something about that stephanie or do you please go ahead so guilt is a useless feeling because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't fix anything. And we don't need to feel guilty about what happened. We need to acknowledge and tell the truth about what happened that has an effect to what happening today. And if you feel guilty, I think there might be if you if you don't use your privileges to make things right, to tell truth, you're part of the system that did that in the past and continues to do that. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the guilt doesn't help. The, the, like, yeah, Stephanie, go. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> guilt again, the guilt again becomes a burden. Yeah. Um, because I feel like you're laying it that, that at my feet and then I feel like I have to try to help you not to feel guilty. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not about that. Um, I don't need your guilt. I need your allyship. I need you to, you know, we, we can't change the past. It's, it's the past. It's there. It's part of our DNA. It's, um, but we can change the future. We can change how we deal with the past. And so your guilt doesn't help move us forward. Um, what helps move us forward is you acknowledging that you maybe feel and have that guilt and saying, okay, now what am I going to do about that? Like this, this colonial system, I, I always like to say it like that, like we're all, colon, we're all conditioned in a system that wants us to, um, that makes us part of that history. So yes, collectively we are guilty of what happened. But once you see what's happened, and once you see the consequences of what's happened, you can choose who you want to be. And if you choose to be a proper ally, and then you don't, first of all, you don't need to feel guilty. And second of all, you don't make it about you. Because feeling guilty is about, but I feel so guilty, what do I do? It's like, no, use your privileges to build a world together that we can be together. And privileges, my white privileges don't feel great because my white privileges makes me part, the representation of my white skin makes me part of a system that is criminal. I do not want to be part and uphold a system that is criminal. So it is up to me to change my ways and the ways that I show up so that I don't need to feel guilty about who I am. And I can use my, what they say, privileges to, to speak up for people that don't have similar privileges. And then guilt is, is not of the thing. If, if you anchored in who you are and how you show up, you don't need to feel guilty. Exactly, that's just what I said earlier. You know, your privilege allows you access to, to certain things, certain power that I, I or, or other people may not have. And so use that use it um it's also for disability sometimes people ask me like um are you disabled yourself because i'm the ceo of a company that works with people that generally lives with disabilities and i'm like first of all <laughs> that's an illegal question to ask me if i'm really disabled if, if i am disabled second of all if i'm a person um uh, and I never disclosed this, actually. <laughs> and you, you might find that weird, but I use it as a tool to talk about those stuff, th those things. If I'm a temporarily able-bodied person, I can speak up for disability rights because people tend to listen to me standing up, not using a mobility aid not being visibly disabled tend to listen to me differently than to somebody in a wheelchair 
that fights for her or his rights or their rights. So be again, the allyship is, you know, me being a CEO of the Olinker maybe <laughs> in that way, but it's understanding how my voice can be a stronger and up, uphold other voices that don't have the same privileges. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. reading the comments to see if there's yes. more. And also we don't be mindful of time. It is one minute past 12 here in Vancouver. Um, I hope this was all helpful for you. The recording will be shared and um, and let us know if you want to have a follow-up Zoom call that we can further talk about those issues yes. because this is a seminar that we really made a seminar to for you to just be present and listen deeply. Um, but maybe there is a follow-up that you want and we can host another Zoom call that is more collaborative and talk further in depth about those issues. So if you are interested in that, let us know. Um, Michelle, interesting. Can I, Michelle says, perhaps I should have articulated it's more a sense of shame or powerlessness to help, but your comments are so helpful in putting this into perspective and showing a way forward. What a wonderful, thoughtful presentation. Thank you much more. And Michelle, um, powerlessness is what this system wants us to feel. This system is based on scarcity. We don't have enough time. We're constantly stressed. We don't have enough money. Oh my God, I don't have the rights. Like all that stuff, this whole system keeps us small by the scarcity mindset. By being in community where we have between us everything that we need, we can feel abundance of being in community and we don't need to feel powerless. We are very powerful. We just need to come together in kindness. We're extremely powerful together. And we need to start connecting to the powerfulness that we have in us. For example, if we're with 10,000 people here and say like today, we commit to not buying anything that has sugar or is processed food in the supermarket. What do you think is on the shelves next week? Not processed food because nobody buys it. We have that power to stop industries. We just need to mobilize. And that means living in the abundance of being in community together, choosing to be kind people, practicing kindness to each other. And then we don't need to change the world, but we can change who we are in this world and build a community yes. that we can feel home and acknowledged in. Amelia says a follow-up Zoom call about this sounds great. We will organize that, um, Amelia, if there's more people that are interested in it. Um, united, we stand, we won't fall. <laughs> exactly. We're not going to fall. <laughs> united, we stand. <laughs> you have some last words, Stephanie, and then we're going to close because it's <laughs> we're over time. But thank you, everybody, for attending and being here and listening. Um, yes, I just want to really thank everyone and say, um, you know, this was about um, sharing and about healing. And as I said in my introduction to myself, I believe in doing this, um, not just for us, but for the next seven generations. Um, that's a practice that we all um, follow as well, looking, looking forward to the next seven generations, um, trying to build a better world. And so I'm so honored to work for a company that allows us to do this. I'm so honored to be a part of this incredible community that shows up for this. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you everybody for being here. See you next time.